Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us at Climate Week NYC today. I'm Helen Clarkson, CEO of the Climate Group, and I'll be your moderator. As many of our viewers know, the Climate Group is an international nonprofit with offices in London, New Delhi and New York. Our mission is to drive climate action fast. Our goal is a world of net zero carbon emissions by 2050 with greater prosperity for all. So the discussion today is about how governments and businesses are achieving a green economic recovery from COVID-19. Our framework for this conversation is looking out across a time horizon of around the next 18 months, so short-term commitments and plans. Our flagship event tomorrow will pick up where today leaves off to discuss how to deliver climate action over the rest of the decade. Do join us for that as well if you can. One of the things I've been most struck by this year is the contrast with the financial crisis of 08-09. I was working in sustainability at the time, as I'm sure many of you were, and we were very much told to wait our turn, not try and muddy the waters and talk about economic recovery and environmental messages. The world would get round to the environment when the economy was stable again. But I'm not hearing that message as much this time around. And we should really take a moment to acknowledge how far our movement has come and how we fundamentally changed the general conversation. We surveyed our business members recently and found that 96% believe climate action is just as, if not more important now, compared to pre-COVID times. And this is supported by the general public. According to a recent Ipsos Mori poll, more than 70% of people globally believe that long-term climate change is as serious a crisis as COVID. 59% of our members believe that any financial support from governments to businesses should come with green strings attached, prioritising industries that cut greenhouse gas emissions and create green jobs. We've seen so much change this year. All of us have made huge adjustments to our day-to-day -day lives and most likely the structures of our organisations. This shake-up is so important because it's allowed us to challenge assumptions and shift mindsets in an unparalleled manner. Thank you for being part of the change. And now onto today's agenda. We'll have our first panel, Green Strings Attached, supporting a low carbon economic recovery, exploring policy responses to the pandemic and climate change. Following our first panel, I'll be joined for a conversation with the CEO of NG Impact, Matthias Liliev, our sponsors for the Hub Live. He and I will be exploring how businesses can accelerate their progress towards net zero as part of a green economic recovery. And after that, we move into a segment featuring regional leaders in conversation with Scotland's Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, Rosanna Cunningham, speaking with Sile Zikalala, the Premier of KwaZulu-Natal province in South Africa. And then we'll be finishing up with our second panel, Building a Better Future, Driving Green Growth and Innovation. We've had submissions of questions from those of you who are attending. Thank you very much for these. And please do feel free to tweet along to the event and make sure to follow up with your peers in our chat function too. Great, well, I'm here for this panel. Um, green strings attached, supporting a low carbon economic recovery. Uh, we'll be joined on this panel by Dr. Wieland Holfelder, Google's Vice President Engineering, Site Lead for Google Munich, who's also the company's sustainability champion for Europe. Susan McCormack, a partner at the law firm Morrison & Furster, once named the most innovative lawyer in North America by the Financial Times. Uh, Commissioner ba Basil Segos, who leads New York State's Department for Environmental Conservation. And Mike Rann, who was one of the world's first climate change ministers, served for many years as the Premier of South Australia and is on the board of the Climate Group. So let's start uh, with you, Mike. As someone who spent many years both as a regional leader and ambassador, uh, what do you think the major policy opportunities are to accelerate climate action through the green recovery? Well, I think that on the diplomatic front, obviously, we've got COP next year, and uh, that's been delayed a year, and that's critically important for everyone who wants to decarbonise our planet to agitate to actually get some momentum going because and there's obviously some benchmarks along the way including um, the world economic forum conference at davos and as we heard at the opening ceremony from prince charles there's now a building coalition about uh, in sustainable markets investment vesting in renewables investing also of course in energy efficiency which is becoming increasingly important as well as transport uh, sustainable buildings and so on. So what we need to do is to use all of these events from Climate Week in book through to Davos through next year to build momentum to actually get something happening and hopefully not see what we've seen in recent years with 
I regret to say, countries like Australia acting like uh, glove puppets of the coal industry. So uh, um, I've seen what uh, Joe Biden has said about his $2 trillion initiative. And obviously, if there was a change in administration with a, a party that's committed to uh, decarbonizing the economy, then that's going to make the diplomatic heft much uh, easier and better. I think also in terms of countries' uh, strings attached, I mean, it's great to see the EU coming up with a comprehensive policy, which is still being worked on, which is saying to business corporations across the board, yes, we're very happy to provide this uh, money for a recovery, but you're going to actually have to see, uh, you're going to show us that, uh, that that money is going to be spent differently in terms of investing in decarbonisation. And I guess that's the big dilemma. We saw with the global financial uh, crisis a few years ago how climate, which was until then the biggest issue facing uh, humankind, suddenly was derailed for four years. And then we saw, rather than getting straight back into it, we saw emissions rise. So we've all got to make sure that after this crisis with COVID, that the rebuild is linked to tackling the biggest issue facing humanity. And there's some great signs. It was terrific to see France and Netherlands coming up with their aviation support package that was directly linked to saying, yes, we're going to put in billions to help the aviation industry, but we're going to do it in a way that says you have to reduce emission 50% per uh, person kilometer and a range of other, other issues. It's terrific to see just last week uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand announcing her economic revival package that is absolutely geared towards uh, uh, decarbonisation, reaching the 2050 target, and also at the same time matching South Australia, my home state's uh, commitment to having 100% renewables by 2030. So there are great examples around the world through the climate group's affiliation to hundreds of sub-national governments Obviously, there's a real opportunity to see them lead their nations uh, in making sure that we have national commitments as well. Thank you. Um, Dr. Wieland Holfelder, um, Google came out with a really big announcement last week with some really ambitious climate commitments. How have your current plans been influenced by the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic has, has taught us an important lesson, I think, everyone, that um, we can also apply to climate change, which is that we know that collective action is essential to solving a global emergency such as climate change. And we also know that we must be guided by science in addressing a threat that we just can't feel or, or see. Um, and, and we also know that the longer we wait to take critical actions to address the issue, um, uh, the more costly it will be later on if, if it's actually still possible to turn this around. So the pandemic has strengthened our resolve at Google that we must take action on climate change immediately. And that's why we announced last week um, that we're committing to our third decade of climate action. The Google has been a very um, uh, sort of um, uh, you know, pro-climate company from the very beginning. Um, we had the first decade where, um, after the first decade, we announced that we were climate neutral. Um, in the second decade, um, by 2017, we announced that um, we actually matched all of our energy um, consumption with renewable energy. And now the third decade, um, uh, we are pledging that by 2030, um, we are aiming to run our business on carbon-free energy everywhere at all times. 24-7, um, 365 days a year. So this is our biggest sustainability moonshot yet. Um, and the, um, uh, the complexity is enormous, practically and technically, of course. And, and we're the first major company that set out to do this. And we, we aim to really achieve this. We've also eliminated our remaining carbon legacy. So um, before 2007, um, when we announced that we have been climate neutral, um, uh, you know, the company was founded in 1998 um, and we have um, eliminated all those um, carbon legacies with high quality carbon offsets. And we're also now committing to work with um, partners in our supply chain to make sure um, 
that um, they can enable um, green energy along the manufacturing chain. So be beyond our own footprint, we are also committed to um, create tools and invest in technology to help everyone move forward to a carbon-free world because um, you know, this is not just a Google issue. If we're um, getting to this point, um, we're just one small company, if you will, um, but we need everyone. And, and since cities rep represent about 70% of global emissions, we've um, actually worked with cities in the past, but we've committed to enable 500 more cities to reduce one gigaton of carbon emissions every year by 2030. That's more than, for example, all of Germany emits every year. And we know that digital solutions are a critical part of taking climate action. I always say um, that climate change or solving climate change is arguably the largest IT project on this planet. Um, and that's why we're also rolling out um, our breakthrough AI technology, for example, for building energy efficiency um, to other industrial and commercial buildings. This is a technology that helped us at Google um, in our data centers to actually save 30% of energy above and beyond um, our already optimized data centers um, for cooling energy. And lastly, um, we've learned the lesson of the pandemic and we know that we need to advocate for a strong clean energy and climate policy environment. So we're committed to strengthening global efforts through the Paris Agreement. We want to establish emission targets and technology neutral pathways to a carbon free economy. And we want to accelerate the next generation low carbon technologies, including um, harnessing digital technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning. Thank you. Um, Suze McCormack, facing the current economic shock, we've seen really different responses from across the private sector. What's the role of corporate government and fiduciary duty here? And is there an opportunity to change things for the better? Thank you, and, and thanks for having me. I think particularly here, I'm talking to you today from San Francisco and here in the US, we have a whole, obviously a variety of things happening. We have COVID, we have the economic crisis, we have civil unrest, and now like Australia, um, the season before uh, the West Coast here is literally on fire. Um, last week we had a day when the marine layer combined with smoke um, and it meant that the, the birds never sang um, and it was dark um, at, around midday, which was, which was crazy, obviously accelerating this, this need for, for climate action. Um, the private sector, it's interesting and, and heartening to hear about Google's actions. I think the private sector is reacting to all of those factors. Um, but I think the good news for us um, from, the, from the world that's focused on, on climate particularly is really um, two things, two very positive things. The first is that sustainability and climate action is being correlated with, with re resilience. You have large asset managers that are announcing that during the pandemic, their, their portfolios are actually delivering uh, stronger results uh, when they're invested in technology that has climate solutions, invested in renewables, invested in companies um, that have, you know, that have, that have tested their climate resilience. Um, capital markets, the major banks with whom I work are seeing an increased demand for green bonds and SDG linked performance, performance linked bonds, which is heartening. Um, and public companies and in the US, the National Di Association of Directors have come out and said, you know, in fact, we're going to accelerate and focus even more on ESG. And the second thing we're seeing is an increased um, belief in, in, in the fact that, that companies like Google and others can think out of the box, can adopt more creative solutions. We now have three publicly traded public benefit corporations. People refer to them as B Corps in the US, but B Corp is a certification. This is really a corporate form 
where you shift the fiduciary duties um, of boards and management. So boards and management will have an equal fiduciary duty to um, a, a, a positive goal, a positive outcome. And for those of the many of these companies, it's going to include climate. Um, and in fact, in the US, there has been discussion, it hasn't happened with our current administration, but discussion of linking um, public funds to actually a shift in fiduciary duties. Um, and there is also this drive to establish a sort of move from a fund model to a permanent asset vehicle model when, when asset managers are aggregating funds, which allows people to think more long term, allows people to, to take investments that can have a greater impact on climate. So all of that I see is very positive coming out of sort of all of these crises. I will say the negative is um, in the U.S., almost half of the employment is within is, is with small business, what we call micro business of, of 10 employees or less. In our poorest communities in this country, it's 90 percent of our employment. Um, those companies with the combination of COVID, the economic crisis and civil unrest and, and now climate are just being decimated. And so it is a tale of, of sort of two cities of two of two companies here in the U.S. The small business is not focused on on climate; they're focused on just surviving. And in fact, we've already lost thirty percent of our small business here in in California. Um, and so that's 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 an area that where I think we need more creativity. And quite frankly, we need the larger businesses in this country to step up and support, or we're going to have. Um, further inequality and, and further economic devastation. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Segos, New York has a 2050 net zero target for the state. How's the pandemic changed New York's delivery against the target? Hmm, good, good question. And, and thank you for having me today. Um, you know, in some respects, I, I think that 2020 has only reaffirmed our commitment to uh, climate action and to meeting our, our really ambitious goals. As, as you as you know, we have a very ambitious goal of net zero by 2050. Um, and that's in fact an enforceable goal. Governor signed the community, uh, the Climate uh, Resiliency Community Protection Act last year. Um, and that has, has given us a, uh, a mandate to meet these very ambitious targets, zero uh, carbon electricity by 2040 and then net zero by 2050 for the entire economy. Um, I think the experience this year, frankly, has has um, has has reaffirmed what we have known since 2012, um, which is we have to rely on science to make tough decisions. Um, I saw the LA Times uh, front page over the weekend: uh, California's climate apocalypse. Um, you know, we we felt that in 2012, uh, Superstorm Sandy hit New York uh, right on the heels of of two hurricanes, Irene and Lee. Um, and for us, that was a that was a major paradigm shift in looking at the environment as connection to to New York. Uh, so, in relying on science, we began, in fact, years before we even signed last year's law, um, sh starting to shift our economy on the mitigation and, and adaptation side, and in helping to make uh, those tough decisions, uh, relying on our on our scientists just as we relied on uh, scientists to make the tough calls uh, with our response to, to COVID here in New York. So I think it's reaffirmed, you sort of affirmed uh, some, some major uh, elements of what we need to do to, to shift this economy. Um, and, and also has reaffirmed one of the, uh, the, the real um, uh, issues that has is, is, uh, beset the country this year. You, you know, you look at the, uh, the social justice uh, uh, the outcry on social justice right now and the divisions that have been apparent for many years that are just coming to the forefront. Um, you know, the same communities that were hit hardest by, by COVID uh, were the communities that uh, have been hit hardest by pollution over the years and those that are most at risk uh, looking long-term at, at climate change. So um, this year itself has obviously been a tough one for, for everybody, but for us, it's reaffirmed uh, our commitment to, to moving forward on these goals. We've also not stopped. I mean, we, we, uh, we signed the law last year, COVID came along, the economy uh, went into shambles, even with a $15 billion budget deficit right now, which is what we have here in New York. Um, we've had an incredible summer of announcements. We had a 
largest solicitation ever for offshore wind and onshore renewables here in New York. We're already the third largest, uh, fastest growing and, and largest uh, uh, state on uh, renewable uh, infrastructure. We banned coal. Uh, there are no coal plants in New York anymore. Uh, we banned fracking. Fracking is not happening in New York. Um, you know, we, we are we are doubling down. I mean, frankly, there's there is no alternative to all of the small businesses that, that, that have been lost. We need to recreate new supply chains, new demand cycles for um, all of these incredible uh, innovations in energy generation and efficiency. Um, so it is one of these unique opportunities right now you, you, to take a to take a crisis like we have on our hands right now and to and to make something better of it. That's what we feel here in New York as, as leading the 11th largest economy in, in, uh, in the world. Um, and it's upon um, you know, several, several of us here at these various agencies to, to work with uh, hundreds of stakeholders on the outside to, uh, to reshape the entire economy. So I think this is a, a watershed moment for all of us. Thank you. So let's start with thinking about um, the green recovery and my first question on that is, when it comes to the green recovery, where should businesses be taking the lead and when should government? Mike, let's start with you on that. Thanks, Helen. Look, on the political front or on the diplomatic front, there's quite, going to be quite a few benchmarks over the next year or so. Ultimately, of course, the end of next year in November, we've got the next COP conference, which will be held in Glasgow. It's been delayed for a year because of the pandemic. So there cannot be any alibis or excuses for not getting the, the, the work done to actually get some outcomes as opposed to deferred outcomes that have so often disappointed us before. And of course, along the way, apart from uh, Climate Week in New York, we then move towards Davos and the World Economic Forum, which has now become a key ally in terms of investing in a, 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 non, a zero carbon future. And uh, as Prince Charles mentioned at the, during the opening ceremony, there is now a massive momentum of investment into renewables, into sustainability. And this is part of the Sustainable Markets Initiative that he and the World Economic Forum are actually leading. So here's the World Economic Forum representing business, absolutely driving a change in mindset, encouraging people not to invest in fossil fuels, which are becoming increasingly stranded assets that need to be propped up by the taxpayer. Obviously, you know, there's some great examples. I've been particularly impressed by the work of the EU. They've put together a, uh, you know, a, a multi-trillion dollar package that's designed about how do we provide the strings attached in terms of giving to business to get economic recovery and jobs going, but at the same time, uh, absolutely ensuring that there's a, a stronger movement towards a, a carbon free world. So all power to the EU. We need the United States also working hard towards next year. And I must say that I'm encouraged that uh, Joe Biden has announced a two trillion dollar um, package. That's also about uh, driving massive investment in renewables and in decarbonisation away from fossil fuels. There's also some smaller examples that are world leading. Just um, uh, last week, uh, Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, announced uh, a tremendous uh, uh, economic revival policy, which is aiming for New Zealand to be 100% re renewable powered by 2030. In fact, uh, matching my own state of, of South Australia, that's uh, well on its way to achieve that, uh, that target. So around the world, we're seeing great examples of where a, a, a COVID recovery from COVID, recovery from the economic recession caused by it, are going to be absolutely linked to, uh, to the best sustainability outcomes. Hopefully, this will avoid what happened after the global financial crisis, where you know, prior to that, everyone was saying that the greatest threat to humanity is, is global warming that suddenly got diverted for four years by the global financial crisis, and then we saw emissions rise. I think we all want to see 2019 being the peak of, of, uh, of emissions and seeing structural change that will drive emissions down from next year onwards. If, if I may uh, just add, 
Yeah. I think. Um, yes, please go ahead. One yeah. of the things. One of the things we are seeing um, with COVID nineteen and the economic shutdown is that pure government money or pure philanthropy it, it can't solve the problem. They can't solve the climate problem. So one of the things that we have been doing is really rethinking how government can play a role. Um, and one of the solutions um, that we've come up with, starting with small business that can be used for climate, is having government funds either providing a guarantee or even more importantly, providing first loss capital to attract a lot larger, um, um, a lot, a lot more, a lot larger um, amounts of private capital to invest. And I would say, particularly in areas that are higher risk, or we're talking about new technology. So I agree that renewables. Have, are a good business on their own. They can stand on their own. They can compete with traditional energy. I, I don't think, I think renewables are great. I don't think renewables are enough. And maybe it's because I'm sitting here in California in the fires, but thinking about deep decarbonization, thinking about energy efficiency, thinking about financing vehicles that can accelerate energy efficiency, thinking about the technology that can actually take car, you know, carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, thinking about sort of, you know, all of the solutions that are higher risk, and if the government provides first loss capital, additional uh, large amounts of private capital will be able to come and really accelerate those industries. So I think there's a role for both, but I think there's a role to rethink how government plays plays its role in in, in accelerating the market. Thank you, and Vilan, what's your take on this? Where where should it be business? Where should government step in? Which areas? Yeah, I, I agree with both. Um, what Mike was saying is that it's actually, um, of course, both sides, but also what Susan was saying, um, that we do need more investments. And as part of our announcement last week, we also um, reiterated that we recently issued the largest sustainability bond in history. Um, we provide $5.75 billion um, dollars in capital that will be used to fund investments in green infrastructure, in operations, in um, energy efficient data centers, in clean energy supply, um, in green building, and so on and so forth. And, uh, um, and so that um, investment, um, these billions of dollars of investment in, in new clean energy resources, um, we believe will create in the order of 13,000 or so new jobs around the world. Um, and, and I fully agree that clean energy needs to make business sense, and it does. We're not doing this at a loss. We're doing this because it makes good business sense. Um, and we want that others understand how this how this works. And so we are also providing um, a grant to fund um, uh, the local governments for sustainability action fund to help the cities to implement climate, climate action plans. And, and, um, and we have a tool that we call the Environmental Insights Explorer um, that provides data to cities to actually make better decisions under a climate strategy. And here in Europe, we are partnering with um, Solar Power Europe um, to introduce training classes. We have a program worldwide that we call um, Grow with Google. It's training centers, or so now it's online, um, where we teach um, citizens and, and um, others um, on digitalization topics. And, and we believe that um, uh, clean energy um, actually makes sense in that context as well. So we're, we're providing um, um, new content through that organization to our um, training centers. And then um, beyond our own um, walls, if you will, um, we're supporting um, green recovery by, by sort of standing up and supporting um, what's going on. And for example, the, the Green Deal here in, in Europe, the European Commission vision um, to create the world's first carbon neutral continent by 2050, if 2050, of course, is something that um, we are very much supporting. And uh, um, Europe has long been a leader in climate and sustainability actions, and, and we stand behind the um, impressive, amb uh, impressive ambition um, that we see here in, in Europe. Commissioner, uh, what's the expectation from the public at the moment? Are you seeing demand for a green recovery? Absolutely. I, I mean, you, you even look last year at the, the marching on the streets around the world. Um, you know, people had made the connection 
that many many in government had not. Um, that um, our future is is in jeopardy. This is a real um, uh, real challenge ahead of us with the climate crisis, and um, and many communities had had felt their voices had been cut out of that. I think since then, we enacted the law here in New York, um, and have and have begun. Um, really an incredible engagement process with the public. So to carry out this enforceable law, we have um, seven different panels, seven different advisory bodies that are uh, charged with providing the, the, the scoping recommendations to help us get to that economy-wide uh, net zero. Um, and these aren't just panels for the sake of meeting, these are panels that are, that are being asked to come up with real concrete recommendations. And uh, the amount of energy that, that these groups are, are bringing to the table is really astounding. You know, we have these online Zoom meetings and, and they're incredibly well attended here. Um, you know, New Yorkers, I think, generally are very progressive on the environment and certainly very demanding of, of government to, to take action if they perceive an issue. And that's, that's, the, um, that's always been the New York way. Right, we gave birth to the environmental movement, the modern movement here in, in the U.S. with the Storm King decision on the Hudson River and, and so forth. Um, I like to think that we have set the, the tone, at least for the country, on on climate action and, um, and and the amount of support and the leadership of the governor on this. It was the first uh, words out of his mouth in the state of the state this year were about the environment and climate. Um, so for us, it's been it's been you know we have we have uh, put together a, a bold plan. Um, but looking long term, I think public engagement is going to be one of the real um, Achilles heels of this of this uh, movement here really nationally. If you can't find a way to communicate the science, the 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 programs, the policies, the kind of dif difficult decisions that we're all going to have to make to as we shift our economy, if you can't figure out a way to do that, it's going to become a, ho a, a whole lot more uh, difficult you know, falling into nimbyism around uh, solar uh, uh, panels in fields or, or uh, wind farms, and that's already happening uh, across the country. Um, and it's like FDR approached the, uh, the, the Dust Bowl in, in the West and the, and the Great Depression with all these great uh, New Deal programs. It, it wasn't just the initiation of a program and all of a sudden fixing problems a few years later. It was, an, it was a massive uh, coordinated effort to communicate out to people, um, these stakeholders, uh, what these policies were, what these programs were, and how we can use them to to help fix the country, and that's certainly what is needed now. And I'm, I'm seeing certainly the, you know, the the programs uh, being uh, uh, discussed at the political level. We have no federal leadership on the environment right now, but there's certainly a debate to be had. We see the, see the Biden uh, climate plan, which I I think is drawn very much from from what New York and California have done already. Um, you know that. Communicating that back out to the people and, and encouraging uh, input, encouraging stakeholders to become a part of the process, I think is going to be the way that we that we get this done and truly meet this challenge. Thank you. So demand from people and then communication back is key. Um, have you, to all of you really, have you seen anything within your own organisations or elsewhere in response to the pandemic that you feel could be applied to collective climate action? Suze, let's start with you on, on that. I would say three. Um, first, we are part of, of Lawyers for a Sustainable Con uh, Economy, which is, um, which is organized by Stanford University Law School, where a lot of law firms, most of the country's large law firms actually took a pledge to committing um, millions of dollars of pro bono to climate solutions. So that is, that is one. Two um, is, I, I mentioned the sort of small business. We have pro bono structured the um, case, the Small Business Rebuilding Fund for California that was approved by the iBank um, two weeks ago. Again, coming up with creative structures. This is a PBLLC between two public charities that allows, it's, it's I'm not gonna get technical, but basically it allows to aggregate a lot of capital with first loss capital to the you know from the from the public sector from the government to deploy to small business without all the fees in the middle without the money managers without um, you know a lot of expense we can keep we can keep interest rates very very low and and deploy capital and I think coming up with those kinds of structures for climate 
is going to be is going to be very very necessary. Um, and third, I would say our work for the carbon endowment. I think you know we could talk about you know technology. We can talk about renewables. I think we also have to deal with sort of the old technology. And um, earlier it was mentioned coal and, and natural gas, but coming up with solutions and viable solutions. Um, the carbon endowment um, is focused on offlining coal reserves, and they've already offlined a couple billion tons of coal. And it's another creative structure where you purchase um, or transfer the coal reserves in, and they're, then they're held by a trust in perpetuity, so they can't be used again. And I think we need we need both sort of the focus on the renewables and the new technology, but also the the focus on off you know offlining offlining coal and some of our our fossil fuels. Thank you, uh, Vilan. And any examples that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, Google is a very data-driven company, as you know, and um, we always say data beats opinions. Um, and what we've done in the um, pandemic is we basically established a, a very data-driven approach to how should we as a company react to protect um, our employees. And um, if you project that to climate change and, and how we react there, it's, a, it's, it's very similar. And, um, and what really um, I think we can see in the data that comes in from what we see from our user behavior is that, for example, when people look for a product online, um, in, the, in the past five years or so, the term sustainable um, has come up more and more. And we've now seen that um, about 10 times more than five years ago. Um, or if you look at how many people are looking for electric cars, um, and that interest based on the metrics that we see in our search um, queries and so on and so forth has tripled in the same period. Um, and, um, and so we see that there is actually a genuine interest um, and it's not just um, something that people talk about. And that's why we also committed and as part of our announcement last week that we want to give the more than 1 billion users that we have new ways to live a more sustainable um, life with our core products. Um, and we already have bits and pieces built in. For example, when you use Google Flights to offer uh, to, to, um, uh, to look for a flight, um, we give you the ability to sort the flights by the least carbon intensive option in um, some of the European countries. Um, and that is powered by an emission model um, that incorporates not only the, the route that um, the, the plane takes, but also aircraft model and seating configurations and, and, and so on and so forth. In, in Google Maps, for example, we make electric vehicle charging stations visible so you can plan your trips better. Um, and, and so we're actually aspiring to build in more and more features into our products so that not only we and, and can take action, but everyone can take action. Um, to to help in this um, in this crisis. Thank you. Um, on the platform and as people signed up, we asked if they had questions for our panel. So you're not just hearing from us. So we've got an audience question. Jim Coleman, head of economics at WSP, asks: In light of the way that things have panned out very differently across countries in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, what opportunities might have been missed for greater international and cross-regional collaboration? What lessons should we be learning about the need for strong transnational and international approaches to tackling climate change effectively? And I know Mike Rand would like to have a go at that question from working with him. Well, I think. I mean, I certainly think that it would, uh, it's terrific to see what's happening in the EU. That's going to be critical for next year's COP um, in terms of its leadership. Um, obviously, in my view, that one of the things that's been missing is a proactive US working with the EU because the two together in terms of trillions of dollars worth of, uh, of recovery packages linked to decarbonisation would be an, you know, an enormously effective leadership. But what we're seeing, unfortunately, is a whole range of international organisations like the WHO and others being discredited. Uh, and so that's you know, unfortunate because it's preventing coordinated action. And I think, I guess, my bounce out of that, I mean, one of the great examples for the climate group at the subnational, and I was in 
the Premier back in you know, 10 years and more ago, was that here we had a whole group of fairly disparate um, states, regions, provinces in every continent on earth, which is, and it's grown significantly since then. And we all borrowed and stole ideas from each other, which helped build a coalition of things. And one by one, we were seeing New York and California, we were seeing various provinces in Canada, states in Germany, some states in Australia, and now most states in Australia, essentially the market leaders for their national economies. And, and one of the things that I think has been terrific is that the, now we have a couple of hundred corporations as part of the, the climate group who are also involved in that. I call it you know, competitive cooperation or cooperative competition. We all kind of every year wanted to come out with our new targets uh, upping the city. It was good for us in terms of our clients or, or voters. But at the same time, we were getting real action moving and momentum going. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be political, but I want to see the US next year in a positive way. I also want to see an active Australia, um, but, you know, hope spring eternal. Thanks, Mike. And as it's Climate Week NYC, I think we'll give NYC the last word on this panel. Commissioner, would you like to add anything to that? Sure. I'd be glad to. I mean, look, I, I, I don't want to get too, too bold here, but I would say that the, the, uh, the U.S. response to coronavirus has, has been embarrassing. And, um, you know, it's been left to the states and largely their own devices to, to address, um, you know, what, is, what, is, uh, what has been an earth shattering uh, uh, year for all of us. Um, so if there are missed opportunities, it's really, you know, the missed opportunity is, is when you have a crisis like this and you have, you have science in front of you, um, you know, that is demanding uh, collective actions, demanding cross-border uh, cooperation. Um, and you, you approach it with a level of arrogance and dismissiveness that I, I believe, unfortunately, our country has, has done. Um, you know, that can have a, a cataclysmic domino effect when it comes to having to make difficult decisions in the future about other scientific uh, problems that are unfortunately hit, hitting us, uh, our health and our economy. Um, and that's climate change, really. It's the, you know, it's the science we need, need to be relying on. It's the, uh, it's the experts we need to be able to turn to and, uh, and to have our administration that, that is so um, kind of painfully uh, uh, politicized that uh, I think is a, is a major major missed opportunity for our country. Um, so uh, I'm an optimist. I, I hope things uh, change. I think they will change one way or another. They have to. Uh, we can't go on like this. Um, uh, but uh, uh, in the absence of that, you know, the states will step up and states are stepping up. We founded the U.S. Climate Alliance a few years ago. Now more than uh, half the uh, U.S. economy uh, is part of the U.S. Climate Alliance. So. There is energy uh, there. There is leadership. Um, it's at the state level. But until we get that at the federal level, I think a lot of what we're talking about here, the point made about uh, the efforts of the EU combined with the efforts of a, of a committed uh, U.S. leader, um, that's what we need to, to solve the climate crisis. That's the only way forward. Uh, you can't leave it to the subnationals. Subnationals can help us limp along, uh, but we really need a strong federal partner. And, um, you know, unfortunately, this year has shown, I think, that we don't have that yet. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much to all of you uh, for this panel. I have to thank you on behalf of the virtual audience that you can't see, but I know are out there and giving you a big round of applause. So thank you very much uh, for joining us on this panel. Thank you. Matthias, we've just been discovering, uh, discussing some of the high-level policy opportunities. So let's talk about the green recovery at a more practical level. How should organisations be using the current moment as an opportunity to accelerate their own sustainability transformation? Thanks, Alan. With the uh, pandemic crisis, we uh, learned that uh, our societies were able to shift fast and collaboratively, reassessing the priorities between people and profit. We now need to learn how to look at climate change in a crisis mode, reassessing the priorities between planet, people, and profit. I'm really amazed by what I've seen during the pandemic and by the fact that sustainability transformation momentum did not stop. 
we actually saw a large number of corporates announcing bold sustainability goals or carbon neutrality goals. Apple, Delta, Nordstrom, HelloFresh, General Mail, Intel, Barclays, and others. And when you think also about the uh, conversation that happened with the uh, stimulus packages, you can see that uh, the big question for states was all around how does that encompass the sustainability challenge? So definitely a strong momentum that is uh, built, and we can learn from the, the crisis by the fact that we were able to move fast, even in ways to collaborate. And so that's what we need now for the climate change uh, challenge, because we're not moving fast enough. We know there are organizations out there doing great things, but how can we scale action faster? Is there a good example we can follow in the private and public sector? To scale action faster, we're, the world needs to think about sustainability in a systemic way. And uh, for cooperation, it means really transformation led by the C-suite. And uh, this, you know, for the C-suite, it means that you need to not only establish the strategy, but also oversee the translation of this strategy into action. And we still have a gap there uh, from strategy to implementation. NG Impact made a recent analysis and that showed that the, the time horizon of the commitments, the sustainability commitments of corporation has shrank from 26 years to eight years only. That drives a lot of accountability. At the same time, our analysis shows that only 30% of corporates are on pace to hit their goals. So C-level driven agenda from strategy to implementation is, is, is really key. And um, it's all about thinking systemic. So for companies beyond their own walls, how do you think about bringing the whole ecosystem, the whole value chain as well, to go on the same path uh, towards carbon neutrality? This is what we saw recently with the announcements of uh, companies like uh, Microsoft or Amazon with the uh, climate pledge. And what about the supply chain? Are there opportunities to use the power of procurement to create wider change outside your own organization? Supply chain is the big opportunity. This is uh, how leaders can shift from action at their level to systemic impact. And really, if you want to be uh, among the best today, you need to encompass supply chains uh, into one corporate ambition. 75% of uh, sustainability mature companies have supplier requirements as part of their programs. And end supply chain was at the core of the announcements of Intel or, or Unilever recently. Research also from the, the CDP shows that uh, increasing by 20% renewable energy use within the supply chain of 125 large corporates would reduce global emission by a gigaton. That's massive impact. So really holding supply chain accountable to more ambitious uh, sustainability action is the next frontier. It's difficult. It requires probably different approaches, uh, more relationship and, and partner, partnership models, uh, but that's, that's clearly uh, the next level for, for, for our global ambition. Great. And finally, there's a lot of disruption in the marketplace at the moment. Do we need to get creative about new models of operation? How can organizations go about that? Times of disruption, for sure, with great risk and opportunities. Some companies will seize the opportunities and emerge stronger, some won't. And there are really three fields of opportunities. Opportunities to bring new business models at scale, partnerships, outcome-based contractual relationship as a service business model, those are not new, but the way to make that really mainstream is, is a, one, one of the opportunity. Second field of opportunity around mature and, and scalable, really cool new technologies like electric mobility for all or hydrogen. And third field is really about rethinking about what performance means by indexing performance to carbon. It's another shift of paradigm, but this is definitely top of mind for the leaders I've been meeting with. You know, the 2020s is the decade to flatten the global carbon emissions curve. We had a rough start with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's learn, let's shift so that planet, profit and people come as equal priorities and let's take action. Matthias, thank you very much.
Hi, I'm now joined by Scotland's Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, uh, Rosanna Cunningham, and speaking with Sile Zikalala, the Premier of KwaZulu-Natal province in South Africa. So let's start with asking, uh, how's your government's regional approach different from the national approach in your respective context? Premier, would you like to answer that first? Thank you, and uh, our humble greetings to everyone. And thank you very much, Helen, for your kind introduction and the questions uh, you have asked. Uh, as the province of KwaZulu-Natal and the African region, we wish to start by expressing our collective solidarity with the people of California and the government of California, but we take uh, comfort in the way they have responded in the devastating uh, wildfires and hopefully we will all learn from there. We are dealing with issues of climate change and you will know that Africa as a whole, especially uh, ourselves in the Southern Africa, we have suffered a number of uh, disasters, natural disasters, including cyclone, which take, took place last year, striking Mozambique, uh, Malawi and, uh, 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 and Zimbabwe. It left uh, more than 1,000 people uh, dead and more than 200,000 were displaced uh, from these countries. Ourselves in the province, we suffered the storm uh, in the Easter uh, last year. I must say uh, the issue of mitigating challenges of climate change is part of our constitution as the Republic. But as the province of KwaZulu-Natal, we've launched a number of programs and campaigns that seek to respond to challenges of climate change. And that include working with local communities, creating the awareness about climate change, but also it includes the manner in which we engage with business community in the province through the KZN Growth Coalition, which is a structure that brings together the government, the civil society, and the business sector. And we work together to ensure that we adapt. And our adaptation program include ensuring that industries themselves tries to work in a manner that avoid polluting uh, in the country. We are exploring more green options through waste management biodiversity economy, blue economy, green tourism, uh, and others. The number of researches that we are conducting, aiming to ensure that we create more jobs, but ensure that we preserve the nature. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you for that, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, Scotland is in a, a rather particular position, um, as are many uh, nations and regions uh, like ours. Um, we were, in fact, one of the first countries in the world to declare uh, a climate emergency. Um, and we have only in the last year um, passed legislation for Scotland because um, climate change uh, and environmental policy is an entirely um, Scottish affair. Um, our, our climate change targets are to reach net zero by 2045 um, as against the UK government's climate change targets for the whole of the UK which are to reach net zero by 2050. So um, we are um, anticipating uh, to be there five years earlier with very challenging targets set for 2030 at a 75% emissions reduction. So you can see that from the point of view of our uh, climate change work, we've set ourselves an incredibly ambitious uh, task. Uh, and that, just, uh, that does uh, mean that we are on a, a rather different road uh, to the rest of the UK and much faster. There are a number of uh, things, however, that we're also doing um, uh, really from our own perspective. We were the first country in the world to legislate into being a Just Transition Commission. And the Just Transition Commission um, uh, came into being in September 2018. It's been working incredibly hard, helping us enormously 
because we are very concerned that the climate change uh, uh, work that needs to be done in the coming years should not leave people and whole sections of populations uh, behind. It's extremely important that we take just transition enormously seriously. Um, and we've been trying to do that uh, all the way along. Um, we are able to be more ambitious than the rest of the UK because of the nature of our geography. Um, we're very much a, a maritime nation. We have a massive coastline, uh, peatland, uh, uh, the ability to reforest in a way that perhaps is more difficult for the rest of the UK, massive uh, advantage in renewable energy uh, resources. Uh, something like 25% of all Europe's renewable energy resources are here in Scotland, um, particularly uh, offshore um, with wind and waves. So we have some advantages, but that also gives us enormous challenges. Um, the final thing I want to say, though, is that we were also the first country in the world to set up a, uh, a climate justice fund that was to assist um, developing countries because we're very conscious uh, of the difference between um, what uh, the developed world has to do to right the wrongs of the last couple of centuries because the people in the, in the still developing world are suffering the price of what we did in the past. Thank you. And both your governments are leaders. You're both co-chairs of the Under Two Coalition. How are you approaching the energy transition, especially as we think about recovering now from a global pandemic um, and setting example for a diverse group of peer, state and regional governments? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well I think I've already um, referred briefly to the energy resources that we um, already have here in Scotland, particularly the the offshore wind and tidal resource, we have something like 12,000 square kilometres of, uh, of coastline. So for us, it's, it's, uh, it's something which is um, absolutely straightforward. Last year, more than 90% of our electricity was actually generated by onshore and offshore wind, hydro, solar and biomass power. So we are making great strides. But of course, we're also an oil and gas nation. So we have to manage the transition uh, not just faster because of the targets that we've set ourselves, but also from uh, an existing oil and gas industrial sector, which in terms of its infrastructure is going to be really important um, uh, in order to make that transition into the newer forms of energy production. So we're very, very um, conscious of that. We have an energy transition fund, which is directly helping um, businesses and uh, uh, localities to to, to really maximise the opportunities that there are there. Um, and we've also got a massive um, £1.6 billion programme to transform heat in buildings and energy efficiency programmes. Um, because um, unlike many other parts of the world, Scotland's problem in terms of its buildings is the generation of heat, uh, not from air conditioning. Obviously, if you know Scotland's climate, it is from from that heating and we really need to be able to do something about that. So we're investing as much as we possibly can in that. Um, and as I indicated earlier, the oil and gas sector is going to have quite a big role to play in that transition. Thank you. Premier. Uh, thanks. I think uh, from our point of view, we can emphasize that the world is facing two emergencies, the climate change uh, or the climate emergency and the COVID-19 emergency. And both need to be tackled immediately, but with the same vigor. We're quite impressed with the manner in which the world, but also our own country have responded to the challenge of this uh, pandemic. Uh, in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, we have a consensus on the need for transition from fossil fuel to energy, which is a clean energy mix. We are aggressively pushing green policies. One of the intervention is that the biggest city, uh, the Tebwini municipality, which is also called Deben, has begun to explore opportunities uh, that are afforded by solar-based uh, generation uh, of energy. They've already been running the solar water heater program, replacing or putting uh, solar water heaters, 
throughout the city. But also as KwaZulu Natal, we boast a massive sugarcane and timber industries, which if beneficiated appropriately, could result in major two energy uh, industries, the electricity co-generation, but also the fuel ethanol production. Already our government is, prior, uh, is piloting this. We've got two uh, special economic zones, and these two special economic zones are also utilizing uh, partly uh, alternative energy to ensure that they generate uh, uh, electricity. We're working with the South African cane growers to pilot uh, the program that seek to convert uh, sugar cane waste into electricity. But also as the province, we are working hard to ensure that we industrialize the rooftop uh, PV programs uh, in all areas, in all municipalities. But the private sector also is playing a role and we continue to engage with the private sector and they have participated in a number of uh, energy generation projects. This includes the generation of 60 megawatt energy from biomass to electrify 60,000 households and the feasibility study is on for this program. So we are working together and what we are emphasizing is that policies get uh, successful if all stakeholders are mobilized and work together, coordinated by government. Thank you. And I just have a final quick question about how you've gathered support from local communities um, and how you're working with those communities to get them on board with these ambitious climate targets. Uh, Premier first. Thank you. The question of public support and public participation is quite important, especially if we are all going to succeed, because if we want to go, we must also ensure that the community is participating. In the province of KwaZulu-Natal, we drive this mobilization of our citizen through the district development model which is a model that seeks to ensure that the national government complement uh, the provincial government, but also the provincial government work with the local government. And this uh, is centered around one pillar, which is called Operation Sukumasake. And this uh, seeks to mobilize the participation of all stakeholders in communities. This include traditional leaders, but it also includes NGOs and other stakeholders. We also believe that for us to successfully mobilize communities, African communities have always been mobilized through the use of indigenous knowledge system to preserve their ecosystem and the environment. So through Operation Sukumasake, we work to bring more education and educate our people on how to preserve uh, the, the environment. We are working hard and this is impacting by providing basic knowledge on hygiene, uh, try to ensure that we preserve rivers, prevent the pollution of the sea, and also ensure that we educate people on how to avert disasters such as lightning and floods. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you, Helen. And I, I would agree, I think, with the general thrust of what the Premier has just said. Governments cannot do this on their own. We need the private sector, we need the third sector, we need uh, action at community level and at individual level. And all of that needs to come together. So it is incredibly important that we are able to communicate uh, properly across all of those different sectors. Um, we are lucky in Scotland in, the, in a parliamentary sense. There isn't any um, opposition to what needs to be done. So that the legislation that I was talking about um, last year went through with support right across the political spectrum in Scotland, in the parliament. And that, that is an enormous benefit to us. 
But of course, um, as leaders, as politicians, we have to be able to get out there and sell things, um, sell that message. So we've done a number of things that I, I think are quite important. We, we put in place a climate challenge fund back in 2008, which delivered grant funding right into communities um, at the level of community groups who put together projects, um, put their bids up, would get funded for doing things. Um, and that helped us to actually make that message real at that community level. And we're also this year, although for reasons connected to the pandemic, this has been delayed this year, but we are in the process um, of setting up a citizens climate assembly again to try and reach out right across the piece to hear from people um, what they think can and cannot be done. And, and we're, you know, from a government perspective, we're going to roll out hubs. And it's interesting to hear the Premier talking about what they're doing, because I suspect if we looked at it, we would find that we were doing quite similar things. Um, these hubs will allow for uh, more um, local and regional um, coordination um, of a lot of the activity, which I think is incredibly important. Um, but I do think it's worth emphasising that for all of us in every part of the world, this has to be a national endeavour. Governments cannot do this on their own. And I cannot emphasise that more strongly. The presumption that we can just sit back and let governments come up with all the solutions doesn't work. Um, and it does need to be a huge um, conversation that involves absolutely everybody. And it has to cross all our boundaries, all our boundaries, internal and external. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to both of you um, for this session and for your leadership on this issue. And we really appreciate you, uh, your work as co-chairs of the Under Two Coalition. And thank you very much for joining us at Climate Week NYC. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks uh, for having us in this program. Thank you. Hello and welcome to my guests. Uh, today we're joined by Katerina Eierborg, who's Executive Vice President of Sustainability and Chief Compliance Officer at the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca. Uh, Damalola Ogunbayi, who's the CEO and Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All, as well as the Co-Chair of UN Energy. And then Jason Porter, the Senior Vice President of the FirstNet Program at AT&T. And Ava Svedling, the State Secretary to Sweden's Minister for Environment and Climate and Deputy Prime Minister. So let's start uh, with you, Ava. Um, with a net zero target for 2045, Sweden's working towards one of the most ambitious climate goals in the world. How are you harnessing innovation to deliver on this? And how do you feel that the pandemic has helped or hindered your progress? Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, for arranging this panel and this uh, discussion today. Uh, COVID-19 uh, has caused a global crisis that we all know, and that also has exposed the uh, vulnerabilities of our modern society very clearly. And uh, most of all, it also shows the significance of fulfilling the 2030 uh, agenda and, and the Paris Agreement. That's absolutely necessary and our responsibility and uh, the only way to, to tackle this. And the road to recovery will, will be long, but uh, it's also an opportunity to create a more sustainable and more resilient society. And we need to, to do that and we need to tackle the two uh, or three crises at the same time. And therefore, it's an imperative that the climate transition is not given lower priority. We hear that sometimes, but rather constitutes a starting point of the recovery. Uh, that be absolutely fundamental. And the focus for the Swedish government is comprehensive investments in green transition, uh, in welfare and in jobs. And this, that's the holistic approach that we need to have. And the COVID-19 recovery, just like the journey towards a fossil free future requires that all policy areas pull in the same direction and we need to, to make them go in the same direction. And the issue of climate change must be integrated into all relevant policy areas. We need the right policies in place to ensure that we build back better and that we build uh, back greener. And we green, uh, the green recovery gives us opportunity 
and opportunities to, to contribute to uh, spurring innovation and intensifying the transition to a circular and a climate neutral society. And we know that uh, from uh, direct uh, and our own experiences how important this is. Sweden's uh, uh, climate policy framework includes a goal of having, as you said, net zero emissions to the atmosphere by uh, 2045, and that's at the latest. I think we need to go faster than that. The framework also includes a climate law, and the framework is uh, not just something this government stands by. It's bound by the Swedish parliament and will apply to all governments to come. And that's also a very important tool for transparency and democracy. Each government has to develop a climate policy action plan for reaching the climate goals uh, and an external council uh, is established to evaluate if the government is doing enough to give up, uh, to live up to the climate goals. Taken, those things taken together uh, uh, are instruments to create a solid foundation for uh, ambitious climate policy and the right environment to build back better. And our ambitious uh, and long-term climate goals help Swedish companies stay uh, in the forefront of sustainable technolo technological development. To further enable this, we have uh, a government initiative that we call that's called Fossil Free Sweden, which uh, where we work very closely with the private sector and with the civil society and with the, with the municipalities to plan for a transition towards net zero emissions. And here the government supports businesses to develop their own roadmaps to become fossil free by the year 2045. And the government recently decided to prolong this initiative. And in light, in light of the current situation, fossil free Sweden was also taken, uh, it was tasked to work uh, with the businesses to enable the green recovery together with the government. Uh, the future is fossil free and the winners will be those who lead the way to circular and climate neutral society. It's uh, through continued investments and innovation uh, and circular business models that we will create new jobs uh, of the future and strengthen our competitiveness. Uh, not least, therefore, we must integrate the green transition into uh, our recovery efforts. I want to also take this opportunity to mention that 2022 will mark the 20th, uh, the 50th, sorry, anniversary of the first UN conference on the human environment. That was a 1972 Stockholm conference. And we see this uh, also as an important milestone as a unique opportunity to accelerate uh, a green recovery and, and transition. And Sweden wishes to use this commemorandum to, to gather the global community in Stockholm and we invite interested partners to work with us to take this opportunity to strengthen action towards a healthy and prosperous planet for all. And we need to use every opportunity and we stand in a unique situation uh, globally and to act together for a greener, more resource efficient and a more uh, resilient future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now turning to, uh, to you, Katrina Ayerborg, uh, from AstraZeneca. One of the things that the pandemic has really made clear is the intersection between human health and uh, climate action. As a pharmaceutical company that's working on the front line of COVID-19, how are you dealing with those issues? Well, thank you, Helen, and uh, uh, welcome to the panel, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. So for me, the first thing to highlight is that just like COVID-19, the climate crisis continues to impact the health of communities, as you mentioned, around the world and every day. And as a healthcare company that I represent, the impacts and challenges brought about by the pandemic have increased, not reduced the urgency of action on climate. For example, the World Health Organization estimates that nearly 13 million people die each year from environmentally related health risks including 7 million people from air pollution alone, making it now the second leading cause of non-communicable disease deaths worldwide behind tobacco smoking. We see the health of people and the health of the planet as a circular relationship uh, in our company. And it is important for us to remember this when thinking about innovation and healthcare in the future. Aside from the current exceptional circumstances where everyone is working to bring a vaccine to market as quickly as possible, it usually takes 10 years to bring a new medicine from early discovery in the lab to being accessible to patients. So if we don't plan and make our decisions with a long term in mind, we won't be able to deliver new medicines to people and patients in the future. And AstraZeneca is committed to being an integral part of a sustainable recovery and 
to driving a more sustainable approach for the pharmaceutical industry, including through its membership of the Sustainable Markets Council and as patron sponsors of UN Global Compact Business Action on climate and health, as well as members of the climate group's key initiatives around use of renewable energy, electric vehicles, and also sustainable power and heat. We see in the company our ambitious zero carbon strategy announced in January as a key enabler to achieving a more sustainable future with a focus on emissions avoidance, energy efficiency, using renewable sources of energy and exploiting opportunities for circularity in how we source energy for heat and power. We have committed to zero carbon emissions from our own operations by 2025 and becoming carbon negative across our value chain by 2030. And as part of these accelerated targets, we are now sourcing 100% uh, renewable power across our global operations. And this is not new work for AstraZeneca. We had been working towards science-based targets in line with the Paris Agreement since 2015. We had already reduced our carbon emissions from operations by almost a third and our water consumption by almost a fifth. But this was something that myself and the AstraZeneca leadership felt was very important to accelerate, not only for the successful future of the company, but to be socially responsible for playing our part in addressing the climate crisis head on. And we have actually committed $1 billion to deliver ambition zero carbon and to plant 15 million trees under our AC forest program. So I think the science is very, very clear and we can't wait. We must work together, all of us, across sectors and governments to build back better and address the connection between health of the planet and health of people. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, turning to you now, Jason, uh, Jason Porter, Senior Vice President at at and The recent pandemic has made us just all so aware of the importance of telecommunications in our lives, particularly those who are now, you know, working from home all the time and really relying on, on things. How, um, as we see the increasing impacts on climate change, how can we make sure the infrastructure and the technology that we are relying on is resilient to climate change, but also helping us to cut emissions? Yeah, thanks, Helen, and it's great to be here with such a great group of people. Thank you all for your uh, heart and passion for uh, for climate change. And and yes, Helen, as you mentioned, 2020 has been an uh, unprecedented year for sure. Uh, if you think about it, the global pandemic, as you mentioned, has certainly uh, challenged us in new ways. Um, we've had to hear in the United States um, you know, from a first net perspective at at and we've had to connect and make sure that uh, thousands of field hospitals and pop-up test sites were uh, connected so that doctors and nurses could serve their patients. Um, but even beyond that, we've had uh, hurricanes, we've had wildfires right now on our west coast, we've had a derecho across the central American states. Um, and so it's just been one thing after another this year in 2020. And all of these climate related events disrupt our business, uh, affect our employees, and most importantly, um, impact our communities. And so um, we've announced that we are expanding our industry leading climate uh, change analysis tool. And we've, we've uh, increased it or expanded it across the entire United States. So we'd run a trial of it in the Southeast and had such great results that we're now expanding that across the United States. And we're also expanding it from uh, simply uh, analyzing the impacts of weather and of uh, flooding and of uh, wind to now also include drought and wildfire projections and this can project uh, up to 30 years in advance we've partnered with argon labs and we're using their comprehensive climate data sets their massive compute resources and their climate models and we merge them together with our network infrastructure so that we can see and predict water levels and how those will impact wind speeds um, and, and as we just mentioned uh, droughts and wildfires and how that might impact our network over the next 30 years and so we can now cross-reference 
are fiber cable locations with sea levels up to the year 2060. And what it's allowing us to do is redesign our network so that our network is more resilient. We can now, um, for example, Hurricane Laura that hit Florida, I'm sorry, hit Louisiana a couple of weeks ago, um, we can now design our network so that it can withstand that or Hurricane Sally that's coming in uh, tomorrow for us in the Gulf Coast. Uh, we can now understand and predict the water levels that might come as a result of that storm surge, the winds, and, and we can redesign our network, elevate electronics, and make sure that our network is more hardened so that uh, communities can communicate after the storm or so that uh, public safety can come in and serve their communities immediately after the storm as well. And similar to other panelists have mentioned, um, AT&T also just announced a commitment to achieve carbon neutrality by 2035. So we're excited and very passionate about uh, getting to our carbon neutrality as well. Great, thank you very much. Um, and now turning to Damalola Ogunbayi, the CEO and Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. Um, Damalola, how do we deliver a clean energy transition that leaves no one behind and, and support faster greenhouse gas emissions reductions? And what impact has COVID-19 had on progress? Hi, Helen, so much for having me here. I mean, I think the key thing is for people to recognize that the clean energy transition and sustainable um, development is just key to everything we're doing. And that's very important in terms of getting to the Paris Agreement. As the world continues to rebuild from the COVID-19 pandemic, countries are really generation opportunity to recover better by investing in sustainable energy. These investments can create full progress on a just, more equitable energy transition that truly leaves no one behind, um, drives economic growth, and it's actually cleaner for the environment. Our recent Recover Better with Sustainable Energy series shows that <laughs> sees this moment to invest in renewable energy, energy efficiency efficiency, clean cooking, and local value chains can develop a more competitive advantage quickly. These countries can benefit from increased GDP, cheaper energy provision, job creations, and also improved agriculture, gender, and health outcomes, while also addressing climate change. So I'll give you an example. For every dollar that's actually spent on renewable energy, there's an additional 93 cent growth that you get. And then for every dollar that's also spent on energy, dollar for dollar equivalent fossil fuel, you actually three times the amount of jobs. The opportunity is, is particularly key for countries across Africa and Asia because it puts a spotlight not just only on the clean transition, but also on the energy access gap. People in developing countries cannot reach their full potential or be economically productive without access to sufficient, reliable and affordable energy. So for me to bring it back again, Sustainable Development Goal 7, access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy shows that we are still off track to meet global targets. Now the pandemic is here, we actually are at risk of going behind. This is why it's really important to and spark innovation and ambition. It can be used to help people economies on a trajectory in line with the Paris Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals. And so there's some key things that governments can do. First is eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. So there's an even playing field with renewables, declaring a monitorium on coal fire, investing in energy efficiency, which is also key. And I guess I'd like to end with the, this year one you know, once in a generation opportunity. This time will not come again where we can actually make sure all the different COVID response packages or the stimulus packages or actually are focused on clean energy, not just because of climate, but also because of economic. Thank you. Back to you, Helen. 
Thank you. And we started to hear there a bit, and you started to mention competition. I want to ask, uh, does accelerated climate action give you a competitive edge um, and how you see opportunity risks changing as we shift towards a low carbon economy? Let's start with you on that, Jason. Yeah, absolutely. It gives you an edge. For for example, at AT and T, our energy efficiency efforts have helped us realize uh, thirty nine point eight million in cost savings in twenty nineteen. So you can see that it helped. It will help, as other panelists have discussed. It, it has helped us reduce our costs and make us more competitive in the marketplace. It also um, through a lot of our work, we're we're able to connect with other communities. Um, we do a, a lot of work with the Rocky, Martin, Rocky Mountain Institute, and through that, startups are able to connect and, and uh, work out new ways to create new uh, technology and innovation to promote uh, climate uh, protection and uh, more stewardship. And so through those connections are also opportunities, opportunities for growth, opportunities for further cost reduction. So all of that helps us compete at a different level. Thanks, and same question to you, Ava. Thank you. I, I already mentioned that in my, in, in my introduction, uh, being in the forefront of the climate transition uh, does give businesses uh, a, a competitive advantage, of course, and, and therefore it's also a good uh, cooperation between governments and, and business. Uh, but not uh, only that, when I speak to Swedish companies at the forefront of the climate transition, they tell me uh, it's not only about uh, a, a competitive advantage, but also uh, it's absolutely essential to survive as a company in the long term. And also I hear from them, our big uh, steel and, and transportation industries that they say they want to be part of the solution. They want to be part of the solution uh, when it comes to implementing the Paris Agreement. Uh, but of course, uh, there are also risks and, and I see it um, that, that governments need to step up and take responsibility to mitigate these risks in order to enable uh, greater climate ambition. We need to take away those risks. And first uh, uh, and foremost, this is done through long term and predictable climate goals, as I mentioned before also, that helps the society to plan ahead for an ambitious and just transition. And uh, also there are several other tools uh, at the hand of the governments and uh, we also need to have this uh, broader um, uh, approach that is education and training is of course uh, essential that enables the labor force to, uh, to uh, to transition into green jobs and, and risk sharing between the public and, and the private, uh, innovation support and also public procurement. Thank you. Thank you. Let's talk a bit about innovation um, and you know where to reach your ambitions. Do you need radical innovation and where is um, incremental improvement um, enough? Katerina, maybe you could start with that one. Oh, yes. Thanks, Helen. I think uh, the session at AstraZeneca is leading as part of the Climate Week agenda around the need for industrial clean heat is one area where we need real innovation to succeed in meeting our targets. Uh, and we can address power through renewables and vehicles, uh, uh, through electrification. Clean heat is only, um, is only <coughs> is a major barrier to decarbonization, our direct operations by 2025. And what we learn uh, can also multiple in our value chain. And we're working to investigate options uh, in this area. And at the moment, the choices are not um, optimal or sustainable even long term. We could, of course, create our own uh, uh, green gas supply chain, uh, but we are not an energy company and this is not our area of expertise. We could electrify through heat pumps and electrical boilers, but this kind of triples energy costs, so not a good use of resources, which we would rather spend on making and discovering and developing new medicines. So we're excited to be collaborating on this area as part of the Climate Week agenda and look forward to some good discussions and next steps coming out of the panel session in the Hub Live later on. Great, thank you. Um, and Ava on that one. Uh, I, I agree with um, what was said uh, and when it comes to clean heat, but of course we also need to, to do uh, and continue to do great investments in innovation and, and circular business models and uh, also in, in policy. 
and I need I, I think we need in the cooperation identify where we need to do the most and it's uh, probably done by the best uh, the best way to do it is by people working in those areas themselves and one example that we have in Sweden from the Swedish government we have the National Innovation Council and that consists of uh, ministers from the government and, and leaders from the private sector and uh, not least Katarina who, who is here with us in this panel today and the aim of this council is to uh, um, that Sweden should advance in development as an innovation nation and uh, strengthen its competitiveness uh, uh, also being in the forefront of ideas and by having this advisory role and uh, it provides new perspectives uh, on key issues in innovation policy that we can continue uh, and do reforms with in the Swedish government and this said we cannot only depend on on future innovations to solve the problems that we face today we need to continue measures and improvements and speed up the climate transition and reduce emissions already today Thanks, Eva. And then sticking with you, Eva, have you got an example of uh, where you've recently implemented some innovation practices to accelerate climate action? Yes, uh, actually, I do. I have a very uh, a, a good example that I'm very excited about. Just a few weeks ago, uh, a pilot plan to produce fossil free steel was uh, uh, launched in Sweden. It's called Hybrid. You probably heard about it. Uh, and the background is, of course, that the steel industry is one of the great emissions that we need to, to tackle. It emits the most carbon dioxide. And, and for every for every ton of iron that, that pours from a blast furnace, more than a ton of carbon dioxide is also pr produced. And, and therefore, this is very exciting and it's in, incredible that we can now take this giant leap forward uh, uh, towards a more sustainable steel production. Uh, and the hybrid project um, uses fossil free electricity and hydrogen and the rest product is the water instead of carbon dioxide and this i would say is the most uh, uh, the biggest technological shift in steel manufacturing in a thousand years and lays the foundation that will enable the swedish steel industry to 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 become entirely fossil free this could uh, reduce the emissions by 10 uh, percent uh, in the swedish emission and it also has the potential uh, to 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 um, decrease the global emissions with with six percent which is of course uh, incredible so that's that's also a result of a, a good cooperation between the private sector and and uh, and the government when it comes to policies and uh, investments in in sharing risks uh, risks so so this is a good example of how climate policies uh, can uh, and investments uh, from the government can spur and enable uh, innovation I, and i think we need to continue uh, on that road thank you great thank you yeah and uh, people don't often believe me when i get say i get excited about steel and innovation and steel so it's great to hear someone else getting excited by that um, jason <coughs> have you got any uh, examples yeah, absolutely. I already mentioned our uh, climate change analysis tool we're really excited about. We've also, I, I mentioned, uh, announced our commitment to achieve carbon neutrality by 2035. Um, and that's across our entire global operation, including our, our broad mobility network, as well as our Warner Media premium content creation. Um, but the, we're going to do this through uh, through the elimination of scope one and two emissions by scaling renewable energy use and transitioning to zero emissions and accelerating network virtualization efforts. So, you know, this announcement for us builds on at and broader efforts to address climate change through reducing impacts, building climate resilience, and its operations and our communities. So using products and services to enable others to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So for example, at and is developing technology solutions to help our customers reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, which accelerate climate impacts. We've set a, a 10 times carbon reduction goal for ourselves to enable carbon savings 10 times the footprint of our operations by 2025. And to date, uh, we've measured global or our greenhouse gas savings equal to two times, 2.2 times the footprint of our operations. 
um, across a wide range of studies. So uh, we're real excited about the future. We're excited to invest in this area and, uh, and we can already see the tremendous results of our investments here. Great. So we're all starting to get um, excited. Let's build on that a bit. And which technologies are you most excited about? Damalola, maybe you could start with that. I mean, it's great and exciting what everybody's doing. I guess my my side of things is really leaving no one behind. So there's still about 789 million people around the world that don't have access to electricity and 2.8 billion that don't have access to clean cooking. So what gets me excited is new technologies around decentralized renewable energy are key, especially as it as leads to battery storage. Second generation lithium batteries are also going to be key, but also tying in the energy access conversation conversation to the clean energy conversation. You find with a lot of developing countries that connection isn't made. Um, and we know that the energy access story can be a clean energy story. I'm trying to emphasize this because, because some of these countries are not large emitters, does not mean they can't go to more harmful fuels if the rice incentives are, are brought to cost. But I really think that the game changer is decentralized energy solutions focused on um, battery storage. Thank you. Jason. Yeah, you know, sometimes uh, the uh, simplest solutions are sometimes the most exciting. Like us here, we didn't all travel to meet each other locally. Um, love what we're doing, enabling all of these, uh, you know, new communications methods that allow us to work from home, allow us to collaborate like this call here um, without uh, driving to a studio or driving to an office. So uh, that will help us reduce our, our uh, carbon impact. And then if you think about technologies, what am I most excited about? Obviously for me, I'm, I'm really ex excited about the internet of things and what that can do for us. It just gives us unparalleled monitoring into spaces that we haven't seen before smart building equipment, uh, lighting, things that uh, they can sense when people are there and, and reduce the power intake uh, or requirements by noticing that no one's there. Heating and cooling, the same thing. Um, think about agriculture and irrigation that identifies when uh, we absolutely need uh, to irrigate and how to uh, eliminate that impact on our water supply even things like shipping and pallets, um, being more smart, not causing um, overuse uh, and just designing the right level uh, to hit the need instead of, um, instead of over capacity designing. And all of our smart city projects that are helping communities figure out how to redesign and, and build their power grids better, but also manage the uh, impact on their cities so that we can reduce that power uh, consumption. Great. And Ava, same question. Was that the question about the, what technology uh, I'm most excited about? Yeah, what about? technologies are you excited about? Yeah. Okay. I already mentioned the, the, the technology in, in producing fossil free steel. But I could also um, broaden the perspective a bit, maybe. Uh, I think it's very important that we need, um, that we use, um, that we combine the recovery policies with the conditions that we need to, when the Swedish government recently decided on more capital to, to support SAS, for, uh, the airline agreed to have a much faster timeline for emission reduction. And now it aims to achieve 50% reductions by 2030. That's also an innovation we need to, see the, uh, the dialoguing and new circular uh, economy business models that we that we can do this in a holistic uh, approach uh, at the same time that we uh, run in the forefront when it comes to technological shifts. Thank you. And then thinking about communities, what do we need to do to make sure that communities are prepared for future climate impact? Uh, Jason? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are expanding our climate change analysis tool and uh, our communities are going to benefit from that in a significant way. Uh, I just got back from the Lake Charles and Cameron uh, Parish areas in Louisiana 
and I, I could see firsthand communities that were needing to rebuild, uh, homes devastated, uh, you know, all kinds of challenges that they're faced with. And so um, if we can redesign our networks with climate in mind, now we can make them more sustainable. We can uh, make sure that when, uh, like Cameron, Louisiana, other networks were down because they did not understand the impacts of a of a climate change and didn't design their networks for that. Um, AT and T and FirstNet can remain up. It's a it's a business advantage as we've talked about in the past, but most importantly, it helps serve our community. It serves our community um, with uh, you know sustainable, reliable communications that allow them to achieve what they need. And going back to the IoT conversation, it keeps those things connected that allow us to minimize our carbon footprint. It allows us to turn off lights and, and manage power in ways that we've never uh, we've never seen before. So uh, really, really makes it more sustainable. Great, thank you. Demo Lola. I mean, I think what's key for me is just the fact that the most vulnerable people need clean energy access, right? In a time of COVID, people just can't stay at home during lockdown. So distributed energy provides that source, you know, increased food security, climate resilience through solar-based irrigation, coal storage. I mean, currently in sub-Saharan Africa, only 28% of the health facilities actually have access to electricity. So imagine when you start thinking about vaccine um, distribution and storage and coal chain. So we just really, really need to prioritize how we're going to make sure it's clean technologies driving the most vulnerable communities and people and having the use of data to be able to, to at least get to a certain um, amount of accuracy on who needs what type of energy and how much energy are people going to consume and how much energy is the health center is going to consume as well. Thank you. Uh, Katerina. Yes, I think, I mean, it's not, it's interesting to hear everyone. I mean, in terms of talking about, uh, of course, clean energy access, also in the pharmaceutical industry, we're, of course, uh, looking at access to healthcare, not just, of course, access to medicine, but access to healthcare. So I think in, if I would also then um, give an example, a more detailed example of uh, um, where we're looking at that is uh, the area where we are, uh, working on the next generation of pressurized meter dose inhaler, the inhaler you use for asthma and chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease. It might not be totally obvious to people that that's, that's actually an area where we need to address and be innovative. It contains the propellant and we are working on one that will uh, reduce the global warming potential with 90 to 99 percent because most patients with asthma need this inhaled product and it needs to be uh, delivered in, in a climate friendlier way than, uh, than it is now. Uh, so that's, we're, that's one example of uh, what we're working on. However, we have to be innovative in how we approach this, but also safeguard important therapeutic options for patients. And I believe it's critical that uh, reducing our impact on the environment doesn't compromise patient outcomes. So that's one area that we think is important, but that we also have to work with uh, uh, moving forward. I think it's interesting to know then in this area that, uh, for example, in, in the asthma area, there are an estimated 176 million asthma attacks yearly globally with around 1000 deaths every day. So if our research then so far can actually uh, make sure that first of all, looking at the access to these devices around the world, but also making sure that it's delivered in a, in a more um, climate friendly way um, that I think is an important area. Thank you. And then Ava, that, uh, I'm going to give you the last word on this and on the panel. Okay, I, I agree very much uh, with what has been said and uh, Damelola uh, uh, said this is really an issue about leaving no one behind and uh, th that's really important to have that perspective in mind. And pursuing ambitious uh, climate action is of course a, a question of solidarity with with our coming generations and we need to include young people in, in the solutions as well and with all people throughout the world and with our ecological uh, system and, and the nature. And, and, and given this, 
An ambitious climate policy goes hand in hand with welfare, and that includes, of course, healthcare, as with, uh, that Katrina is talking about, equality and justice for all. So this is the whole issue of just transition. Uh, we know that climate change affects everyone, but it's not uh, affecting everyone uh, equally. And it's who you, uh, you are and where you live uh, that really greatly determines how much you're affected by climate change. Uh, but through an uh, inclusive climate policy that takes account of all people, we can ensure that resources are directed to where they are needed the most and that everyone will benefit from the achievements of the development. And let's also um, have in mind that it's really, really important that we use the, the, the tools of the International uh, Cooperation, uh, International Development Cooperation in this situation with, uh, with tackling the, and we need to also strengthen uh, the multilateral system. Uh, and the cooperation globally. I think that's one of the most important perspectives that we need to have in mind in, in tackling uh, simultaneous crisis. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, all that remains is me to thank all of you on behalf of our audience. I think one of the problems with the virtual format is you can't hear everyone applauding you now. So I'll do it on my own on behalf of the audience. Uh, thank you all very much for joining me and for this great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>so that brings an end to our flagship session on the green economic recovery. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their contributions to a fascinating event today. And I'd also like to thank all of you for listening in around the world and being part of the Hub Live. But there's still plenty more to come today. There's now around 35 minutes of time for interactive networking and our exhibition for attendees where you can meet your fellow delegates and visit some of the booths. Then we'll be back after that here in the auditorium for the Walmart Sustainability Milestone Summit, which brings together a stellar lineup of CEOs from business and civil society organisations. I hope that you enjoyed the session as much as I did and we'll see you all again soon.